examples and what is happening in our countries and uh, in, in especially in our region in Latin America. Latin America is a very special region because it's where I live, it's very nice. I hope you, some of you go to Buenos Aires for the ICANN meeting and uh, it's next November. I'm so excited to, to welcome you, all of you there. Uh, it, uh, but it has some Special characteristic. It's uh, it's the region with the highest and balanced distribution of wealth. This is extremely challenging for everything that you want to do in the region. You have the most beautiful and developed cities. If you are in the center of Buenos Aires or Sao Paulo or, or Mexico, in some of the of the of the parts of the city, you feel like you're in Manhattan or Paris. But 10 blocks away from there, you have people that live in total poverty. You don't see that unbalanced in other regions of the world, and that's extremely challenging for development. And, and we all want that gap to be smaller and hopefully in existence. So uh, this, is, this is challenging. It's a large region with big countries, small countries, island countries, and uh, mountains, uh, big. Uh, Games and uh, um, today, if you if you think that 75 percent of the traffic of the internet goes outside the region and goes through the United States or Miami because that's cheaper, that is extremely challenging for infrastructure. This means that the region is not really connected among itself. So this is one challenge, and uh, luckily there has been uh, an. Uh, idea from the different governments of the region to interconnect those countries, especially in the South America uh, region. Uh, this is especially good for those countries which are inside, um, not, not in, 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 they are inside the, the, the 
region, uh, in terms of Colombia and Paraguay. Those numbers do not have direct access to the international fiber optic cables that go around the coast in the Pacific and the Atlantic. So um, there was a commitment in the one UNASUR meeting in 2012 that all these countries are Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Venezuela, and Colombia, all of us were come to interconnect, and among them Paraguay and Bolivia. So that will benefit uh, their connectivity very much and, of course, make the cost uh, extremely lower than what they are today. Another interesting thing that is happening in some countries, not in all of the countries of the region, is that there, uh, there are many internet exchange points. What is, what is the, the importance of an internet exchange point? There is a lot said about that. And uh, ISPs go together and gather together in a place so they don't have to pay for the transit of the information about one and another to interconnect their networks. But it's not only that. The internet exchange point becomes the place where content is located, where the community goes to place servers with, for example, Google has in, in the main ISP in Argentina uh, a server with content, then I can have a server there, and uh, there is a good server for, for the internet there, and other companies go together and gather their, their content. So this 75% of unbalanced um, uh, traffic that goes outside the country will slowly but surely keep it in the country and in the region. This means that we will not have to pay for um, expensive international costs for connectivity, and finally, people will have to pay less when they pay their bill to access the internet. So IXPs are important. There is also one regional IXPs. Uh, in, in Latin America, we didn't have one, and we have uh, now a regional one. The very interesting thing about the IXPs, and I think Andrew uh, said a very interesting sentence, the private-public partnership. Those IXPs have been mainly driven by uh, private initiatives. And the government uh, helped it happen. So no, com no government was against, uh, on the contrary, all of them were uh, for them. And they happened without problems and driven mainly by private initiatives. Some countries still don't have IXPs in Latin America, so that's something I know I also is doing very hard work. Uh, my friend Chris is doing a great job there. So uh, we still have work to do. So uh, internet exchange point is something that I wanted to extend to, to rise. Uh, Argentina has several now, Brazil has many, and other countries and regions do have, some others don't. I would like to share with you some uh, examples of rural uh, connectivity. I, I, had, I was so lucky to work with a project in one province. You know, Argentina is a federal country. We have 23 provinces. Some are very, very wealthy and some are poor. And one of the provinces in the north part of Patagonia, which is the south of the country, they, have, uh, they had a very um, lack of water. So if you don't have water, you have nothing. So they they built uh, how do you say aqueduct in English? Aqueduct. Thank you so much. Uh, they built an aqueduct uh, as like five years ago, and one of the leaders of the project thought that it could be good to light fiber. He told me that it was so difficult for him to get to get the, uh, the approval from the leaders of the project, from the government of the province, because they didn't understand at the time the benefit. You know how much increased the cost of the whole project, adding fiber optic? Has anyone in the room has an idea how much the price of the whole project was increased by adding fiber in the whole province for the aqueduct? Any number? Just, a, I, just for fun. 3%. 3%. Only 3% of an increase of the whole price of the project brought fiber optic to all the locations of the province. And it's a province that needs to be developed. It's not among the wealthiest provinces of Argentina. Since then, they started to build uh, a provincial uh, internet access network. And they offer very low prices for access 
in all small locations, and they have they are changing completely the life of the people in that province. So I was so lucky to to participate in that project and help them in building that. And I would like to stress the fact that this was the leadership of one person that saw the opportunity and fight it for that, because it was not easy for him to get the approval from those. Uh, we're thinking about water, which was very important. If you don't have that, you cannot build any internet. But now they have water, they have water and they have broadband at very, very accessible prices. So this is uh, an extremely uh, nice project. So if you want more details, I can put them in, uh, in contact with you. Um, I, I talk too much, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so when is the time you let me know? Um, so ISPs, um, this project about uh, also there are some provinces fully connected, like a uh, province in the west, which is called San Luis. And uh, this is a full provincial project. They have what three Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi all over the province. And in all the uh, in all the schools, then um, we have um, a national project uh, that gives computers to students. It's the largest in the world. More than three million computers have been given to students in high school, and it is it is totally it's a new project. So we are seeing what is happening with people. But the nice thing is that the, the families are starting to use the computer, not only the students. So the mother looks for the recipes how to cook, and the father looks for a job, and the brother of the the owner of the computer is uh, playing with the computer as well. So the, what we see is that the internet and the use of the came into their homes and uh, just an example and I, at home I have a, a lady that helped us with, uh, with, with my mother but she is getting old and her children connect with my children through their computers that are given by the government so this is a very interesting inclusive project also there is a national project uh, called Argentina Conectada that is now in fiber all, all over the country. Uh, they are installing several kilometers of fiber into the north and south of the country. The country is quite large. Similar projects are being done in all the countries of Latin America. So we hope that all this, um, these networks will be connected one day. But just to finish, um, I'm, I'm available for, for questions and comments, of course, about the enabling environment. Um, I would like to say more about that. I'm not only an um, advisor to the government, I'm a university teacher, and this is something that I do because I like so much. And what we saw in, uh, is that the, the presence of Latin Americans in these meetings was very low, always lower than Africa. So we started um, a training program in 2009. We have been organizing it every year in different countries of Latin America. We have trained more than 300 people so far, professional. It is called the South School of Internet Governance. And I'm so glad to, to announce that the next one will be in the Caribbean for the first time in Trinidad and Tobago, in April, in the, in the frame of the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the CTU. And um, we grant fellowships to all the students they don't have to pay anything during one week of intense training. Um, and they can meet among themselves and meet with the leaders of the region and of the host country. And uh, thanks to several organizations that are around here, like Internet Society, ICANN, and others that help us to do that. Also, we think that small and medium enterprises need special attention. Latin American economy is driven mainly by small and medium enterprises. As uh, in Argentina, it's like the 92% of the economy is driven by small companies, and some, sometimes they are very small, like two or three people working. So, we started uh, a new space for debate and, and, and learning for small and medium enterprises. It's called Dominion Latin America. We have uh, organized two years once in Argentina, once in Colombia. Next one will be next year in Mexico. And uh, to finish, I would like to share with you that I am also uh, working with the National Center of Engineers. We're trying to promote the career engineering in among women. We think that there's a lot of work for women in the engineering arena, and uh, we need more women to develop the country. So this is the focus, and it was um, it was um, 
highlight what I saw in the last year for the Women's Day, the work we do, and the thank you for that, it was very important for us, the work we do in the Commission of the National Center of Engineers, where I'm a board member. And uh, if you're interested in, in how we can include these issues in university teaching uh, courses, I'm organizing a workshop in the meeting of ITAN in, in Buenos Aires about universities, ITAN, and internet governance. And I will stop here. I talked too much. I'm so sorry, uh, Dijani, but I'm, I'm very enthusiastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Olga. I'm not sorry because uh, you gave a very good uh, presentation and you gave us uh, a good picture of what is happening in your collaboration. Um, I have two remarks. First one, I have been in, um, in Brazil a lot of times, but uh, the first time I got there, I was shocked by the, the social part. Not only between the cities or between the city and the suburbs, but also inside the same city. There are quarters that are very poor and others that are uh, better than New York, which is a shocking period. And uh, I understand that it is uh, more difficult there to try to, to uh, make development using ICT. The second uh, remark I had you spoke about the use. Uh, people are uh, making um, uh, from the computer and internet. And I am a little bit sad that in the whole world, even at home, in my own, the use of internet is not at the best efficiency. On the contrary, I, I am not saying that uh, people are using internet for any, um, uh, how to say, uh, useless. For useless or for, for uh, yes, for useless things, for things that wouldn't uh, uh, promote the development in the country. And this is about education for sure, but also about uh, uh, how to say about uh, monitoring, especially for the children. And I would hope that in the future we pay attention to this uh, issue. Uh, we have technology and uh, um, expensive technology, so we need to make the best use of it for the benefit of the development of our countries. Thank you again, Monica. And now, last but not the least, Zahid Jamil, Marister Atro at Jamil and Jamil, Chair of ICC Pakistan's EBITT. Committee and member of the executive board of ICC Pakistan will address the role of internet in creating and developing a sustainable business sector in those and the seven regions. The floor is yours. Yes, it is a pleasure to be here on parts of the constituents and fantastic presentations, wonderful thoughts. Uh, about what uh, Olga said, you know, um, we have a concept of water is life, and uh, Ali Hayat, and now with the open and accessible entry, is now life. You know, it's all open or accessible or available, and we're going to have that which And um, it comes to mind when we were seeing that video of Olga Hayat, which I think was a fantastic video to share. Um, you know, I remember the, the, the girl saying, we have the whole world in our hands. That was a wonderful phrase. And it's interesting how she also mentioned that there was a divide. And what I'm concerned about, uh, as we from developing our business sector, is are we, ourselves, developing countries, possibly, some of the ways that we are, are going to move forward, and others by not moving to the economic sectors, shooting ourselves in the foot. And why do we make ourselves a digital divide for ourselves? And the reason I made some of these points about the whole world is that there's a distinction I feel that exists between ICT and the internet. This is something that everybody turns around and says, well, they're the same thing. And I'll say it completely different. So when we talk about ICT, 
bringing growth and development and employment, that's a different thing than what the internet has been able to do as far as growth, employment, and for developing countries. Because an ICT can be very just local, and that's it. A payment system that is run by an ICT platform can be local, and that is it. The uh, communication, if it is just local, is still ICT. Does it create some growth? Of course it does. It does help having the telecommunication infrastructure. But it's the internet that brings that change. So I think it's important that we start thinking on the basis of this internet and the government needs to start thinking about, aha, if I want to promote growth and uh, employment, I'm not talking about just promoting ICT. That's local. I want to promote, and it's a tool, promote internet, open, accessible, and available and affordable as well, of course, internet to people in developing countries. And the internet is something that can be good, can be bad, can be used in many ways. It's a tool, as anything would be. And I think we put too much stock in the internet is this and the internet is that, and some of the countries that we come from. At least I can talk about myself. Now, talking about a little bit about the kind of things that have happened in developing countries, you know, there's a business process outsourcing look in India, the Philippines, and Pakistan itself. Huge growth in the outsourcing sector, that's jobs directly. And it wouldn't have existed if it was only ICT, because those, those outsourcing sectors are using the internet, not just the TCPIP protocol, but the fact that the TCPIP protocol is global and open, so that they can okay. Multinationals are, are able to be created from developing countries. So Businesses from Pakistan have been able to go to the Middle East, go to Africa, go to South Asia, and go to Southeast Asia as well, and develop in the Middle East market as well. Their the business because of that accessibility, so that their back end offices in Pakistan can do something in the Middle East conference can be the sale office front. The logistics sector, incredibly, has been this is something we don't hear about too much. The World Bank was doing this. How the logistics exercise, you don't use a paper. Uh, ticket anymore. You use electronic e tickets. There's no more print. Um, I drafted legislation in Pakistan on, for, for the carriage of goods. We had to do electronic goods relating and senior bills, things of that nature. Electronic air, airway bills for, for carriage of goods. And there's a whole industry that has developed recently called the freight forwarding sector. And I can tell you one thing, dealing with them very, very closely, that they have not only Overtaken the shipping lines, which by the way are the biggest thing that everybody ever saw in the industry. Shipping lines were the kings. And now the shipping lines are subcontractors of freight forwarders. And guess what the freight forwarder does? He sits on his laptop, connects himself to the internet, and makes deals. That's it. Nothing else. He doesn't touch the cargo, he doesn't touch the container, he doesn't clear the cargo himself. All of it is done electronically. That's how the world goes around with these things. And that's why it's not ICTs. It is the internet, the open, accessible, unobstructed, without being talking to be more clear on that internet. In the banking environment, we've seen how everybody talks about this wonderful thing with microfinance, microbanking, and having a mobile phone that is able to uh, you know, transmit money. But then again, we've seen that instead of saying, yes, we accept the fact that you should be able to do internet-based transactions over that system. We've seen a backlash of saying, no, 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 keep it local. Only banks, local banks, and no cross-border payments. So you're not able to send money back and forth in many countries, because instead of accepting the internet model, they've accepted the ICT model, and they've turned around and said, well, we'll have no payments. And that's it, that's what we're stuck. And that's where the World Bank is still grasping between internet-based payments versus what they have called branchless banking regulations, branchless banking schemes, which to me is odd. Because it's not about branchless banking. It's supposed, supposed to be, it should be about internet payments. And because we don't have that, I can't transact on Amazon. I can't access PayPal. I can't access half the services across the world because I don't have a payment mechanism to do that, unless my credit card works. And then Sometimes it doesn't because it's not acceptable. So there's a big difference between you know what we can say as a driver, great diversity, and, 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 and uh, the internet itself. And so the innovation that has come through the last 20 years or so 
I fear, and I'm going to get into some sort of arbitrary, is about to do a 180 degree turn. There's a rejection of the internet. There is a desire of governments and best interests to do things like none of us have run since Let's keep it close. Let's try to do regulation. We've seen, at least in my country and certain regions in my, in my region, in the Middle Eastern region, a deliberalization of the telecom infrastructure. And this is funny because nobody's, nobody's talking about it. We've talked about the liberalization of the telecom infrastructure that led to such growth, etc. We have a deliberalization that is taking place, not because of an international treaty, but just because of governments and certain infrastructure are getting together, deliberalized. And there's no push to say, don't do it. There's no push to say, this is a violation of the gas treaty. There's no push to say that this is a reversal of what brought the world. And that's my point. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot through that deliberalization? We have getting we have these oppressive laws that we see coming up in different places. And we look at those oppressive laws, we say the law was reactionary. It was only designed to address a certain issue, but did it do one thing? Did it actually ask or have a consensus on what is the risk assessment and impact assessment of this legislation? Most of the time, we find they, they've solved the problem by localization, they've got the control, they've achieved that, but nobody's doing an assessment. But once they've done that, what is the impact on the people? What's the economic impact? What's the impact on their innovation and growth in the economy? And what, what will it do to jobs? And so we have these localization protectionism. It's basically protectionism of a sort, because the local industry is under great. That means I locally can charge what I want. Because there is no incentive for that local data center to give you something cheaper. I would challenge anybody, and I can say that again, I challenge anybody who's going to set up and force a local data, local data center to be set up to say that it must give cheaper services than cloud services. If that happened, and with the same efficiency, I'd be happy. But you will find that it's not happening. The localized services are more expensive, less efficient, and are becoming an issue. And it, by the way, is also a gas violation. It's a violation of a WTO, WTO treaty. You cannot do that. That where this reversal is taking place, this deliberalization is taking place, these obstructions are being created. There's no, but there's no response, none whatsoever. And we are doing it in developing countries to ourselves. Either our governments are doing it, or we're keeping quiet about it sometimes. And so we're sort of partially responsible. Remember that the filtering of the internet. When you block a domain, it doesn't block just the internet because you can't see it on Safari or Internet Explorer or Google. Guess what? It also blocks your email. It blocks you being able to communicate. Yesterday, I was trying to share an email address, and I won't mention the country, with somebody. And they gave me the email address. The trouble was, because of local filters and server issues, it won't show up as an email I can email to. That's the kind of problem you may end up with. And one of the examples I'd like to share from Pakistan, there is such, due to this deliberalization and the rejection of the internet by vested interests, not by the people, or not by the users, but the vested interests, that void task is a problem. My country started also. We have FSL up that has come in. Without paying the price for taking over our national infrastructure, the parliamentary society, the economy, much of this big company, have come in. And this is not a big US or European corporation. It's still a big corporation with a government related, but it's still powerful. But it's not European, it's not Western. It does not make money, taking over the resource, control the entire infrastructure, and at the end of the day, is saying that you need to shut down all sorts of void. And we have, in the last six months, I can personally tell you, had to get people out of jail. They spent weeks in jail. Because Edisalat wanted to criminalize, it did criminalize, use of legal IP. That's a serious issue. And the question is, what are we going to do about this at an international level? Because everybody loves talking about accounting principles and stuff. And what are we in our developing countries doing to ourselves by showing us our And what do we do in international forms to try and change that is the next question that I'd like to ask. The same entities are now able to say, well, I'm the only one from 250 ISPs, and I'm only one ISP or two ISPs in the country. I'm not going to let the 3G auction go through because I want to make sure that my infrastructure feeds the bandwidth everywhere. And 
I want to be able to survey and monitor on a unified basis. This is what I gave you. I will give you surveillance by giving the excuse that I will filter. Because remember, when they say filter, filter is not the only thing they do. Anybody who filters also is monitoring automatically. And the answer is the moment I do that, if I am surveying, guess what else I can do? I can start charging you on the service that you're using. So I will charge you if you use YouTube more than if you were just sending an email, even though the bits and bytes may have been the same. This is a huge change. What are we doing? As I said, well, we are creating the digital divide in our own countries in this respect. And I'll leave you with a thought. You know, it's, it's important to not just have best practices, but best balanced practices. Because the practice is developing all over the place, regionally all over the place. It needs to be balanced, it needs to balance the rights, and obligations, and, and freedoms of people. And I'll stop there because I feel like we're running out of time. And the final one I'll sort of leave you with this. What are we going to do about stopping ourselves from committing harakiri, suicide, ourselves, and stop blaming somebody else and look at ourselves and say, what are we going to do in our own countries and have them do an international forum to reverse this whole thing? Because that great, wonderful internet ICP growth we keep talking about with World Bank reports, well, guess what? It's about to disappear. It is going to start reversing if these things do happen. I hope it doesn't, but I'm sure we will do something about it. We need to pay attention to it. It's just the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saeed, for this uh, presentation. You gave us uh, a very good picture of what is happening in Pakistan, which is not uh, very, very happy, unfortunately. But, Zahid, um, uh, I don't know what is the definition of ICTs you know, but because the, the one I have is information and communication, uh, information and communication technology, and the internet is part of the ICT. ICT is, is, is wider than internet. Internet is a, a part of the ICT. This is the definition I know I have, and this is the definition that I am using, and most of the people I know are using. So I cannot say uh, uh, ICT is different from internet. I would say ICT is broader than internet. Internet is part of the ICT. This is one uh, remark. The second remark is about uh, security of exchanges. Uh, security of uh, transactions. It is a very important, very big problem. And uh, why not have payment, uh, e-payment? Because there is a problem of e-signature, of securization of the, the, the transactions. And this is something that really we need to address, and we need to address very seriously. By the way, this uh, question of uh, e-signature is not solved even in the developed countries, even in Europe. They are working on, they are uh, advancing, but they didn't solve it. They don't, the, the countries, for example, uh, generally don't recognize the French e-signature for transactions. So the e-transactions are still, um, how to say, suffering from this point. But for developed countries, they are advancing, they are, they are finding solutions for our countries we are not looking on. It is different from Tunisia, for Tunisia because we have an agency for that and we have very good uh, advancement in this. Uh, but what we need really is not the basic nature in Tunisia, the great organized in Tunisia. It is more or less useless. It's not useless. But it, it, it is not as fruitful as any, any signature recognized in the whole region. And um, uh, we are working, my ALS is working uh, on the recognition, the, uh, uh, say, the mutual uh, recognition of the e-signature in the Mediterranean region. By the way, the uh, European Union is organizing those days yeah. A similar in, uh, in Amman, in Jordan, about the e-signature in the South Mediterranean. And we are 
part of this uh, seminar, we uh, participated in this organization. So those are the two uh, remarks I want to make. Uh, now um, I will give the floor to you, to participants. But before that, I'd like to ask Aziz if we have uh, remote participants, if we have uh, uh, questions, remarks. We have uh, one remote participant from the Okay. Okay, thank you. So I will take the questions from the floor. My role, one moment. Second, third, and fourth. So my my role, please. Thank you very much. My name is Mario Amina from the transcript uh, from Costa Rica. Uh, um, basically, I don't have that much time, so I'll be very quick. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting inputs from all of you. Um, personally, I've been involved in uh, ICT and education for some time in Costa Rica, so I was very much interested by what all the and Fatima have said. And um, I just wanted to share with you that in Costa Rica we have uh, a foundation which is sort of a branch of the Ministry of Education, the Marnega Foundation, and actually uh, that's the same sort of work that Fatimata was uh, talking about, and uh, the foundation runs approximately 1,200 computer labs, and also has uh, one um, has programs with a um, one laptop per child, mobile, you know, and computers, and uh, has been I have been involved and I work for them with them, and. Uh, there are many challenges when you develop these kind of projects, and one of them has been the attitude of the adults, actually, and, and mostly the teachers. I don't know whether it's the same is happening uh, uh, in Argentina, in Argentina, and, and in Senegal. And the attitude, the behavior of the teachers who feel very threatened, uh, because it, it, this, this kind of projects is a challenge to their traditional roles and the way they be you know, trained as professionals and the relationship they have with the children. And, and really, uh, it's very, um, it's the kids, they, they tend to adapt very quickly and, and, and enjoy it, like, like the girl, you know, we have this movie from the girl. So um, there is a lot that can be said about this kind of project. And I just want to finish um, mentioning the, the role of the parents. And, and as we were saying, in Costa Rica, uh, the experience has been that we involve the parents too. And, and the community leaders, especially um, with the mobile thing. And, uh, and we have this experience, I mean, parents are very, uh, not very well educated, but they suddenly, you know, the, 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 the children have started educating their own parents and teaching them, uh, te actually teaching them how to use the computers, and, and they are wonderful experiences about that. So I just wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie Laura, for these remarks. Very useful. Yes. Hello there. Um, Khaled Hajjad from Jordan, Society of Tech Trials. Um, so, what I have to say is we can't think of ICT and development without actually thinking about its challenges. There are challenges that we really need to address. True that the world calls for internet access for all, but let's not forget that we should keep in mind the current challenges, the barriers that at times might fire back, like inclusion. Our multi-stakeholder approach must not forget about, for example, girls and women who are deprived from this great blessing called the internet because of cultural or economic barriers. We need policies that promote inclusion rather than exclusion. Uh, women in the ICT field, at least in my country, Jordan, are marginalized in their, in their own fields. They lack the support needed. Whenever you see a woman at an ICT firm, she's one in 10 or one in 20. That by itself is exclusion and it's a, um, it's a consequence of, yes, providing access for all, yes, calling for um, IT professionals and cultivating this culture of women within an ICT field, but, but that by itself needs to be addressed. The questions remain, how can we ensure inclusion while calling for internet access for all? How can we ensure that the inclusion of women and girls into the ICT field? Um, I, I recall the honorable ladies uh, brought up the issue of enabling environments. That's very true. Uh, we lack enabling environments where women feel empowered and feel leaders in their fields. Uh, think of the forgotten, for example, libraries. 
Do you guys still have our libraries? We still do have libraries nowadays. Um, uh, think of the libraries, really, as places of employment. Uh, they are there. They provide a safe and enabling environment that requires IT professionals. Um, and they are hubs, IT hubs, for their surrounding communities. Uh, they enable girls, they, they, they provide that safe, enabling environment. Let's call for policies, if we're talking about development, let's also think about policies, let's think about the consequences of, yes, providing access for all, but what to do next? How can we provide inclusion rather than exclusion? Uh, that's the only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Uh, we agree with you, and there are policies to be done, but women also have to take the lead. Uh, and, and one of the conferences that we held at the Center, the National Center of Engineers, uh, we, we tried to empower women in, into the career of engineer, which is what I do. And uh, after a while, one of the young ladies came to me and she said, you know what, after I heard you, I went back to my province and I went back to my, the Council of Engineers that was, was always held by men. And I decided to, to run for the presidency and I did. Because you encouraged me. So women also have to take the lead. It's not only the policy, it's we have to help our girls and our young professionals to go ahead. I'll hold it, I'll just add one, one, one other thought. Um, the truth is, is that policies are great, but most governments are still run by men. And if you're expecting men to solve a problem for women, you, you are going to be similarly disappointed most of the time. The best thing that women can do is to start their own companies, make their own money, become, become influential in their own right. Don't wait around for men to hand over the reins of power, because that's unlikely to happen. Thank you all. Yes, please. Um, I'm Hannes Horny from the Worldwide Web Consortium. I'm the chair of the Web Payments Group at the W3C. W3C, for this, said, you know, build the technology for the web to win 4 billion people around the world use the standards that we create. Um, we have a Web Payments Group. We are building technology to integrate payments directly into the web. So, for example, you know how you email someone that's halfway around the world, just put their email address in, hit send. We're doing the same exact thing for mine. And this isn't some kind of theoretical idea. The technology exists, we have built it. And now, uh, the biggest challenge that we're having is getting this technology into uh, nations that need it. And that's what we don't need. But that's what we don't know how to do. And that's what I was hoping to have a discussion with some of the panel members about, was how do we go about taking this technology, which has factors like Google, Mozilla, huge, huge technology companies behind it. It's being built into mobile phones so the 2.5 billion people that are unbanked in the world can have access to this, this uh, monetary infrastructure built into the core of the internet or the web. The question is, how do we work with uh, local agencies to get that technology into the hands of the people that need it? Thank you. And, um, thank you. Um, that's uh, very interesting, but I don't think the problem is technology. I think the problem is legal more than technology. And uh, if we don't have now the possibility to make a secure transaction among countries, it is because of the legal the, the, the link, the link of the, the how to say, the, the, the texts. Yes, and uh, agreed, agreed um, uh, um, uh, legal uh, texts between countries so that uh, the basic matter can be recognized. But I know that the technology is evolving, and now we are, we are getting better, we, are, we have better, uh, how to say, uh, conditions, technology, technological conditions, the main problem was the legal aspect. I, I, I would I'll share some of the perspective of the challenges that we were moving, but I also think that um, there is a possibility for central banks within each and every country to be able to allow it. Yeah, there's nothing that will stop them. If you have a discussion with a lot of indications, they will tell you that basically, even if you don't have any electronic signatures, which I think is important, it must be done. 
but many of the transactions electronically online, which are payment processes, uh, don't necessarily require that it's signature unless you're using an SSL sort of certificate for the website itself. Uh, so it is still possible to do it, although I think the, I just want to make sure that I'm not contradicting it, I think that's important as well, and that needs to come in. However, at the same time, you could actually be able to process this. And service providers, as you mentioned, I won't take names, just to be neutral, do have processes and technology by which they can agree with this. The trouble is that the World Bank is, has to push this issue and not accept the framework. They're getting pushed back from these places of saying, only the best agendas, only the banks, only the drugs and spanking is able to do this. Imagine the kind of trouble PayPal has had in these regulatory frameworks where we able to do this. So I think it's a question of trying to go to the bank of international settlements, from the district banks, places that we have in them, work with these people. Otherwise, you know what? I think it would be a long time until we truly see the benefits of electronic commerce in the world because we cannot have commerce without payments, we cannot have electronic commerce without the companies. And I would just add that there's the issue of taxation. Because the government in almost every part, and especially unfortunately in the developing world, developing, we talk a lot about taxes in the global north, but developing world taxes are very high, and oftentimes extraordinarily high on things like broadband and broadband transactions. And what it does is it creates a damping effect. But until and unless governments start to see this as an opportunity, and make it easier and try to get their hands out of the pockets of people who are trying to transact. This is another thing. Not only do you need law, but you also need to, uh, some sort of an agreed taxation framework. Sophie? Yes, and I think that is right. We're talking about DNA in the environment. We need to be in the environment in terms of legislation, even legislation, taxation legislation, all types of legislation. But you also need to integrate, create that enabling environment into policy. When we talk about a national school connectivity plan, it's not just let, let's put computers into schools. It's what's the policy necessary to bring together, to have a holistic approach with the government, to bring together uh, with different departments. How can we get promote investment? Then also, how can we have training uh, to the teachers? How can we integrate it into the syllabus? How can we uh, how can we integrate the maintenance? How can we integrate the monitoring and evaluation? So it's that enabling environment is much further than just uh, having the internet available to everybody. In order to have impact on development, in order to be a motor for growth, we need to think of the wider issue, not just how we bring the internet to people. What's the impact? Thank you. You want to add something? Uh, I have a panel that I have to be on and for the and slate for it. Um, I'd love to pass my part around and have a longer discussion about this stuff. I, I believe that everything that you said uh, certainly applies, but we've actually already, we're well down those roads to, to, to solving those, those, uh, those issues and those problems. Thank you. Thank you. So please. Yes, um, I'm Lita Sakat. I'm actually from Yemen. And we have our own difficulties in Yemen as uh, involving democracy. Uh, but I'm also living in Sweden and I have the privilege of doing the World Foundation's web index uh, for Yemen. And it turned out to be the last country, not my fault. But the thing is that uh, Sweden, where I live, it was the first. So we, I cannot actually tell that one of the pillars of any reform or development would probably be transparency and openness. So I was a bit disappointed in not raising that much in this panel because it's really key. If information is enabling, it's, it allows citizens to act. And once citizens act, change uh, evolves over time. So the aspect of openness and open networking, in fact, uh, the government of this, is important for, as a policy measure that would follow later on in steps and implementation of e-government and other aspects. So that's my comment, just to reflect on Thank you very much. Uh, what, what I can uh, say is that all the intervention was contributions, wasn't questions, which is very good. I'm really happy. Please. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jackson from Vanuatu. And uh, yeah, a small Pacific country. Uh, I do acknowledge uh, the panelists for a very important topic, uh, especially for small island developing states. 
Um, there's, uh, for small island developing states, uh, there's, there's better, lots of uh, competing priorities, uh, apart from technology and the internet, such as global warming and climate change and all these things. However, for my country, I'll just give additional comments. Uh, we've had a sector liberalization in 2008, uh, which uh, from that liberalization, uh, ICT and technology has become a very competing industry in our country. Um, we do have challenges such as low literacy, both oral and written. Uh, we have infrastructure uh, challenges that covers electricity. Uh, we have 83 islands, which is uh, spread over 1,300 kilometers. We have poor roads and things. Costs for services are very, very expensive. And uh, we have 161 languages for 250,000 people, which makes us one of the first countries in the world. However, saying all this, uh, with 92% coverage of telecommunication services and 95% of people on mobiles, uh, internet is still very, very low. There's about only 12% of people have access to internet and uh, there's also heaps of other initiatives such as connecting schools, tablets, internet cafes. And uh, I know this Bill is here, he helped us uh, set up our first IXP in the South Pacific uh, region, and we do have good support. Um, and something that I picked up from the panel is uh, the ICTs and internet is uh, we have to realize that they are an enabler and not a solution to uh, all our problems that we're talking about. And the best thing that governments uh, can do is, uh, uh, at the national level is to uh, create an investment opportunity to de developing policies that, uh, from multi-stakeholder. And when we talk about multi-stakeholder, it's, it's very good that we give ownership to all the st stakeholders within the multi-stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are 20 minutes late. That's why I'm obliged to make you uh, Yes, please. If, if only one remark. The last one, please. Thank you very much uh, for the time that I uh, can share for our, our, our mission. Uh, There's a very good representation of the whole presentation in this uh, topic about the internet is the engine of uh, development and growth. My, my name uh, Manila Mahatana from Indonesia. I'm a Balinese. Thank you for your visit. That is my uh, holiday. I'm a government. So, since one, the conclusion of our forum, Asian Pacific Economic Forum, last October, the first week of October, that the connectivity is the uh, the one of the conclusion that how country of a uh, uh, member country for the APEC can increase the connectivity. Internet is one connecting us. As long as we are, uh, understand and agree that, uh, agree that internet is a very important and become the engine for the development and growth of the country, how can the international organization uh, can help the country? Of course, it's with, uh, a developing country um, uh, to strengthen or revitalize the ICT infrastructure. Uh, from the capacity building that mentioned for the other presentation to develop capacity building, uh, for example, for the hard and soft infrastructure and also for human resource development that are uh, very expensive for developing country. So, uh, maybe, and, and the, the next question is really getting, relating to the recognition that maybe a very important to have agreement in the forum, international forum, what kind of regulation can accommodate it for every problem in the internet that can make uh, abuse for the children, abuse for the people, or movement, something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sorry to, uh, to stop this meeting because people are waiting. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, uh, session is adjourned.